Well, after an introduction like that, I hope I don't mess it up. No pressure. I feel like, man, after that time in worship, I feel like you could put Ronald McDonald up here. And I guess we got the same hairstyle going. Some of y'all are ruined for the rest of the night. You're not going to be able to take me serious. You're just seeing red and yellow, thinking about Big Macs. <laughs> um, open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 22. As you do that, uh, it's always such a joy. Uh, I don't say it because I feel like I have to. Um, I say it because I really mean it. Um, it's always a joy to come and be with you guys. Um, I really love your pastors. Man, they're the real deal. They're the real deal. Um, maybe, maybe you're figuring that out, but uh, I feel like we know that they're the real deal, and we're we're honored to be able to link arms with them. We're honored to be able to be with them and run with them and celebrate what God is doing here. We pray for you guys from a distance. I mean, even though we're not that far, we're in Orlando. We're praying for God to rock the whole Central Florida region. All right, we're, we're with you in spirit, believing that God would pour out his spirit, that there would be a sweeping move of the glory of God a wild demonstration of God's sovereign power to unveil the beauty of his son and to bring men unto repentance. Um, God is building a family for his son. It's what he's promised him. He promised him a people. And so we're trying to do everything that we can in the days that God has given us to be alive um, to invest our lives into the inheritance that the father promised the son that he loves. It's what it's all about. He's coming back for a people. You should see your life in that context. You are his reward, and he will come for you. <laughs> he will come for you. <laughs> like Gabriel told Daniel in the last verse of the book of Daniel in chapter 12, he said, Daniel, be faithful to the end. He said, because surely you're going to die. Now, if you understand it chronologically, that's before chapter 6, because the encounter starts in chapter 11, and it covers through the end of chapter 12, but it's under chapter 6, so it's before he goes into the lion's den. <laughs> he has this wild encounter, and Gabriel tells him, be faithful till the end, for you're going to die. But don't worry, God's going to be faithful to you, and he's going to raise you from the dead. And you will enter into his reward at the end of the age. This is what we're living for. I'm telling you, man, the earthly stuff, it fades. All the bright lights, all the glistens, all the attractions, the persuasions, all the nonsense of the conversation of the world, it's all going to pass. And at the end, there will be one. And he will be more radiant than every other. He will be gloriously enthroned above every single thing that has ever been. He will be the one that has been worth living for all this time. And at the end, we will know it more than we've ever known it. He is the worthy one. All right, so we're, we're honored to be here tonight. Um, that was my wife and our niece leading worship tonight. Um, I always say, uh, my wife is my favorite, and we are better together. Marriage is amazing. Who's married? Let me see. Marriage is amazing. Don't raise your hand reluctantly. Come on now. If you're married, you know what I mean? I don't care what was going on at the house before you came to the meeting. Marriage is amazing. <laughs> we just celebrated 15 years two weeks ago. 15 years, five kids, three cities, six houses. All kinds of countries, millions of people, 
just insane adventure loving Jesus and giving him the yes that he deserves. Um, and that's really what I feel like the Lord has put in my heart for tonight. In Matthew chapter 22, um, uh, Pastor Dominic told me I could go till like 1.30. He said, I'd be super impressed if you could beat Alan. <laughs> uh, Alan is a hero. Um, we're really not going to go till 1.30. All right, some of y'all are already like, no, nah, bro, you've got till like, what time is it? I don't even know what time it is. We're all in trouble. Uh, I don't even know what time it is. Um, but in Matthew chapter 22, I feel like I have some things to really unpack from my heart. Uh, and if it's all right, um, I didn't necessarily feel to come and aggressively preach to you tonight. Matthew twenty two fourteen says it this way. And depending on the translation that you read, it's going to be incredibly familiar for some. I feel like the Lord tonight is looking for intimate friends. He's looking for a people that would love him for him. A people that would understand his worth his value, and that would love him the way that he desires to be loved, right? And we, we get an idea in Matthew 22. We're going to look a couple of other places. As a matter of fact, we're probably going to talk about a bunch of the Bible. Uh, but in Matthew 22:14, 14, we find a verse that's probably very familiar to us. It says, for many are called, but few are actually chosen. And depending on your translation, it's not that I don't really like that verbiage. I just think that other translations, other renderings of the scripture, that they create an emphasis in a little bit of a different way that really it, it, it heightens, it enhances the desire that God has in the way that he extends himself towards sons and daughters. And I think that that's the point, because as we read it, Matthew twenty-two fourteen 14, in the verse that we just read, depending on what translation you have, NASB, NLT, ESV, CSB, BSB, um, HCSB, whatever version of the Bible you read, I like to cover a multitude of versions so that I can get a bunch of different language and construct the point that God is longing to make. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with studying a variety of translations of the scripture. I think it's, it's necessary, it's helpful. It's rich, but in the Passion, it says it this way. For many are called, or many are invited, but few actually respond with an excellent yes. You see, the first way that we read it, it, it heavies too much on us creating an exemption on who God selects. Because if you think about it this way, many are called, but few are actually chosen. Then how do you determine who's actually chosen? Who does the choosing? If everybody is called, do I have any accountability in the selection process? In the way that we originally read it, it does not sound that way. Or the implications of many are called, but few are chosen means that there's a, a committee of sorts or one grand governor that oversees the whole process and makes the determinations. When we read it in the other way, which was the passion, it says many are called, many are invited. Many are invited. Everybody is welcome but few actually respond with an excellent yes. I want to ask you tonight, are you willing to say yes to the Lord? Before you answer too quick, are you willing to give him the yes that he's asking for? Are you willing to give him the yes that he longs to have? Are you willing to give him any yes, or are there boundaries? Are there parameters? Are there certain thresholds? Are there restrictions? Is there a condition upon the yes that we'll give him, the way that we'll love him? In Philippians chapter 4, we know it. It's become bumper stickers and memes and hashtags and so commercialized. And it's the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4. And as we read it from earlier, we know it because of verse 13. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But in verse 11, Paul begins and he says, I'm not talking to you because I have some need. He's like, I don't need anything. He's like, because I've lived in opposite extremes. 
I've had seasons of great sorrow and suffering, trial and troubles and persecution and famine. I've had seasons of great tears and lack where there wasn't all of these grand testimonies and wild breakthroughs and these seeming mountaintop highs and celebratory moments. He says, but you got to understand, I've lived through moments where God has been my portion, where he's been enough for me. He said, but then I've also lived in the opposite extreme. And I've had moments where there has been more than enough and I've lived in abundance and I've celebrated and I've danced on mountaintops and God has seemed to do everything and there's been answer to prayer and all of these things and it's been wild and it's been grand and it's been beautiful. But he says, I've learned something in being faithful in opposite extremes. He says, and this is what I've learned is that there's a radical middle. He says, and it's him that's in me. He's really alive on the inside. And I can do all things. I can do the lows. I can do the highs. I can do more than enough. I can do not enough. I can do sorrow. I can do celebration. Because I've learned something. It's not about the context. It's not about the circumstance. It's not about the situation. The situation no longer puts a demand on my devotion. You see, because some of us demand a certain type of situation in order to demonstrate a certain type of devotion. (laughs) Are there boundaries to your yes? Well, Lord, I can only love you if you give me a certain type of lifestyle. I can only love you if you give me a certain political climate. I can only love you if you give me X amount of dollars in the bank account. I can only love you if you give me this social circle. I can only love you if you open these doors and give me the microphone and put me on this platform. I can only love you if things are going well. What are the boundaries to the yes that you're willing or not willing to give to the Lord? And are there any? It's something that we all have to consider because the relentless nature of Jesus is that he's looking for an intimate people. He's looking for a people, this great Hebrews 11 company. Those who are exiles, they're foreigners, they're sojourners. They're passing through this life. They realize that they're seeking a city whose maker and builder is God. They have found their portion. They know their promise. They've received their inheritance. Jesus has become everything to them. And they long for nothing that this world has to offer them. You can't buy them. You can't break them. You can't offer them, persuade them with any type of compromise. There's no certain type of friend that you can buddy up next to them in order to derail them from the will of God. There's no conference circuit that you can put them on that would get them to cater to the lust of the world and the pride of the flesh rather than being accountable to who it is that God has asked them to be. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can do because this world is no longer their home. It's not their portion. The anthem cry of their heart is take the world, but give me Jesus. And of this Hebrews 11 company, it says, and God is not ashamed to be their God. God is not ashamed to be their God. A people that have been broken from the lusts of the eyes and the lusts of the flesh and the pride of life. A people who long to be intimate with Jesus and to live in a constant, ongoing, ever increasing communion and fellowship with the lover of their souls. All I want is him. This is what Paul is saying. It's what echoes from what it is that he's giving as an exhortation. I don't have a demand for anything in this life. I can be faithful to God wherever he puts me. I can be faithful to God wherever he puts me. My devotion no longer demands a context. You no longer have to do a particular thing with me in order for me to be faithful to you. I can love you anywhere. I can go anywhere. I can do anything. It doesn't matter what you're asking for. It doesn't matter what you want from me. As a matter of fact, anything that you want from me, I want you to have it. How many of you long and have a burning on the inside for Jesus to have what he wants in you and from you? Lord, anything that you ask me for, you can have it. Anything that you long to have from me, you can have it. There's nothing that I hold so near or dear that I would rather possess than knowing that you have me and you can have my yes. You can have my yes. Ask for whatever you wish. 
That sounds amazing. Until he actually starts asking for stuff. Oh, it sounds amazing. Until he stands at the door and I knock. Hey, behold. I stand at the door and I knock. And anyone who would actually come and open up the door, I will enter into him. And will dine with him. When Jesus comes knocking upon the door of our heart, we have the beautiful opportunity to love him with our yes. If Jesus had a love language, one of them would be yes. For anyone who's familiar with the Gary Chapman book and the five love languages, yes, there's words of affirmation, there's quality time, there's physical touch, there's gifts, there's acts of service. If Jesus had a love language, one of those would be yes. He said it himself in John 14, 15. Those that love me will be those that obey me. And then he said the counter, or he said the opposite. He said, and in fact, those that are not willing to obey me, those are the ones that don't actually love me. Maybe you didn't know it or not, but you can actually gauge. There's a barometer for you to be able to determine how much we actually love him. We can sing songs on Sunday, but we should live the lyrics. (laughs) Just because you can sing songs, it doesn't mean that you also live the lyrics. I give myself away. My life is not my own. To you, Lord, I belong. Really? Is that the way that we're living? This isn't to be like condemning and confrontational. Let it be confrontational wherever it's confrontational. But in John 15, because in John 14, 15, he says those that obey me are those that love me. In John 15, 14, he said those that love me are those that actually keep my commandments. And in another translation, it says those who obey my instructions, those are my intimate friends. Well, what yes am I supposed to give him? Every yes. Every yes. I don't care what yes. Every yes. Every single yes that he asks for. You see, because this is, this is human nature, and it's the way that we're so prone. It's how we're, it's how we're geared. It's our makeup. We're always looking for the right Yes. Right? Because we, we all in the room carry a sense of destiny, a sense of promise. We all carry this divine desire. We know that God longs to do something. We know that God longs to use our lives. And we all burn to be faithful to the Lord. At least this is where we're all supposed to be living. We should be burning to be faithful to Jesus. But we spend too much time evaluating the different yeses. And we spend way too much time trying to dial in the right yes that we can offer up to God by our own analysis, trying to work the configurations to figure out what yes it's going to be that's going to connect the dots in the right way for the things that I want. And so if there's an opportunity to say yes that comes to me and I evaluate that it's a yes that I think is leading me towards things that I ultimately am after, then I'd be willing to say yes. And in moments where the yes isn't important enough, where the yes doesn't seem significant enough, where the yes isn't going to be um, catered to the things that I think I'm after, then in most instances, by my own evaluation, I reason out that it's not a yes that's worthy enough of my attention. But let me tell you the problem with that type of thought process. Jesus is Lord. Praise God. (laughs) Jesus is Lord. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Right? Revelation 1.8. The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Now, Now, these ideas, at least in our mind, are not mutually exclusive in God. He's not 
either the beginning or the end. He is both of them simultaneously because he references himself as the great I am. I am. God exists in an eternal present tense. Right? I am. This is what he says in Revelation 1.8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and was and is to come. Which means the is is coming. Right? He is in an eternal present tense. He is I am. Right? This is what Jesus said in John 8.58. When they were asking him, he said, before Moses was, I am. They understood what he was talking about. When Moses stood in front of the burning bush and he said, who am I to tell them in Exodus chapter 3? Who am I to tell them is sending me? God said, tell them I am that I am. Because what I am, I am, and there's nothing else for me to be. I am not changing. I am eternally what I am. I am consistent. I am forever. I don't have something else that I desire to become. It's why we can trust him because he's not a man that he would change. He's not a man that he would lie. He is eternally the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, we need to understand the impact of that whenever we consider giving God a yes in what we know to be the experience of time. God is not bound by time because he is eternally present. He is I am, which means he's not just Lord, meaning beginning and ending at the same time. He's the uncreated one. He's not like us. He doesn't have birthdays where he's reminded of how old he's getting. Right? God doesn't work on a linear time plane. Meaning we have a birthing moment where we enter into time. And we are heading one direction. Right? As much as some of us might want to, to make corrections, to go back and and change things, to go back and make a different decision, maybe as much as most of us would want to, we cannot enter into yesterday or yesteryears. What is past is past. It is behind us. It is called history. Well, history is his story. And God is Lord over time, which means he's not like us. Which we understand that. He is constantly throughout the scriptures trying to communicate how other he is. But he's not working on a linear time plane like we are. We have a birthing moment and all of us are heading forward. Towards what the Bible would say is the moment or the day that has been appointed unto man, every man, to die. Where we are going to breathe our last, we will be held accountable for how we invested our life for the deeds done in the flesh and the days that God gave us to be alive. We have what is called right now. And the yes that we give to God right now probably matters a whole lot more than we might even understand. Because God is eternal. He is unchanging. He is the great I am, but he is not just Lord. He is Lord over the timeline, which means he's not pressured by time. We were born into it, and so we feel the effects of it. You know when you're late. (laughs) Well, some of us don't. (laughs) We're just, we just are who we are. I mean, like, I'll get there when I get there. Other ones of us, we get anxious. We feel the pressure of time. Peter says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. Because he's not bound by the pressure of time. But I want to help us to see something. Because he's Lord over the timeline, he understands what he's doing from the beginning, and it's consistent all the way through until that epic moment that we will know as the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is consistent, and God is faithful to his word. 
I felt to come and encourage, to offer an injection of hope and courage tonight, that God is faithful to his word. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. But he's Lord over the whole timeline. And what that means is that because he's Lord over the whole timeline, that he's not bound to it. God is not subservient to time. Time is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And because Jesus is Lord, it means that time is not. Which means that time is a tool that is serving God's purposes. Time is a servant that God has created and employed in order to further the agenda that he has while he is working in time in order to bring all of time and creation to the destination that he desires. And he's using time in a very particular way. One of those purposes is to ready the inheritance for his son that he loves. And he's Lord over the timeline. And this is why moments of obedience cannot be overlooked. Moments of obedience cannot be minimized. You cannot dismiss a yes that God is asking you for because you are not the one that gets to determine the reaping or the consequences of your yes that you invest into time. God is. Because he's Lord over the timeline and we are not. What that means is, let, let me simplify it. We don't obey outcomes, we obey Jesus. And some of us hold our obedience hostage until we're guaranteed the information of a certain outcome. And we say things like, I'll do it if. I'll say yes if. If you tell me where it's going, if you tell me what it's going to do, if you tell me the consequences, I'll sow this yes if you tell me what it's going to reap. And we spend more time trying to examine the outcomes of our obedience rather than investing in the yes that God is asking for. Because we are trying to be Lord over the timeline. Because we all feel the pressure of wanting to make sure that the investment of our lives count. And none of us want to waste time. And so we spend a lot of time trying to manipulate time. To work towards our best felt interests. Rather than being free enough from this life to serve God's interests and realizing that whatever yes it is that he may be asking me for is working towards a purpose that he's already determined and said is good. And whether or not I evaluate it as being worthy of my time, attention, or investment, I'm not the one that's Lord over the timeline. Right? We're, we're building something. Jesus is Lord over the timeline. It's why fasting and praying is so important. Have you ever gone on a fast and been super disappointed with God when you were done? No. Nobody does that. No. I've met people that have never been able to reconcile their disappointment in God from things that they expected him to do that he did not do. And most of that disappointment is because we created a time frame where our expectation was for him to perform, for him to come through, for him to do something in a specific allotted time that we created, which is why it's called expectation, because we expected God to be or do or say, and he did not come through on my timeline. But what's important is that he's not trying to come through on my timeline because he understands he's Lord over the whole timeline. And time is something that's serving his purposes and not just catering to our demands or desires. And I've met people that have never been able to reconcile their disappointment in God. Because Lord, I just don't understand. You asked me to do this. 
You asked me to fast for two days, 10 days, 40 days. And I feel like you gave me these things. And you said that you would do this. Have you ever received a promise from God that didn't come through in the time you thought it would? No. Nobody does that either. I think at times we have to be honest. Because everybody in the room has been disappointed with the Lord at some time. There's been moments of deep disappointment where we've had to confront our idea of who we wanted God to be. And at times, his lack of desire to cater to my demands of who I wanted him to be. But it's cool because God, he's super comfortable with who he is. Because he says, this is who I am. I am. And I'm not trying to be who you want me to be. I am what I already am. And I'm comfortable with what I am. And I'm going to keep on being what I am, even though at times you want me to be something than, other than what I am. But I've met people that have never been able to reconcile their disappointment in God. Because you didn't come through in the time that I thought you would. They received a promise from the Lord. Let me ask you a question. We'll make it super simple. God asked you to fast for 30 days. He says he's going to save a loved one. You fast for 30 days and it doesn't happen. At times we get super bitter. We get disappointed. We don't understand. Lord, this is what you said. You gave me this promise. I'm holding on to it. Lord, you you asked me to make a significant investment. Lord, I sacrificed. I'm just using fasting as an example. This isn't like some book plug. I wrote two books on fasting. That's not what I'm doing. But Lord, you, you asked me to give you 30 days. I gave you 30 days. You didn't hold up to your end of the bargain. Like what's going on? Lord, I don't, I don't get it. Where are you? Right? See, this is this is this is our vantage point. Right? This is many times our perspective. We end up thoroughly disappointed. We end up losing motivation to say yes again. <laughs> right? We're just going to keep it real. We end up losing motivation to say yes again, or we start to evaluate certain types of yeses that we're willing to give. Because we know that we just can't be full out, like blatant, outright, like I'm just not saying yes anymore. We know that that's not an option. So we've got to say yes, but we'll just, we'll, we'll tweak the dials a little bit on what type of yes I'm actually willing to offer. Because I've given yeses in my history that didn't turn out for me the way that I wanted them to. But let's say 30 years from now, on so-and-so's deathbed, the Lord beautifully finally has a moment to bring their hearts to repentance. And before they cross over into eternity, God saves them. Did he lie? (laughs) Did he lie? You see, God gets to determine where on the timeline the investment of our obedience actually gets reaped. Our responsibility is to sow when he asks us to sow. He is responsible for the consequences of the yes that we sow. Because he's Lord over the timeline, he gets to manipulate the consequences of yes that happen on that timeline and to say, if you would give me 30 days right here where you would say yes, I'm going to take the investment of that yes. And I'm going to take that yes. And because I reign over the whole timeline, I know that so many times you're so preoccupied with yourself and your own desires and the pressure of time that you feel and all of your investments and the way that you're trying to evaluate everything that you have going on to try to manage all of your yeses to work towards the conclusions that you think are going to be best and it's why you dismiss a lot of the things that I'm saying to you because you have your perspective and not my perspective but if you saw the timeline the way that I see the timeline that you would understand that I reign over the whole timeline because I am because I is and was and the is is coming and if you would give me 30 days right here then I'll take these 30 days and 
I'll sow it into the timeline if you would say yes to me and give yourself to me and I would determine the consequences or the reaping of that yes 30 years from now. Oh, the power of saying yes to God. The power of yielding your heart in loving surrender to Jesus and giving him any and every yes that he asks for. Rather than spending time, because most of the yeses that God comes to us with are not yeses that we want to answer. You don't get to determine what is the important yes Man, I feel like there's some people in the room tonight that you're literally like in a pivot. You're in a moment where all of your life could radically shift and the hinge point is the next yes that you give to God. Now, now, now before we get like super excited about that, we have to determine the types of yeses that actually are connected to destiny in God. Right? Let's evaluate some of these yeses. Right, Some of these yeses look like, let's observe Daniel chapter 1, for instance. Daniel chapter 1, they're in exile. It's him and his three friends. They're entering into a three-year training period for the king's service. It says that they are no longer able to publicly gather, no longer able to read their scriptures. They can't even speak their home language anymore. And they get their names changed. You're no longer going to be Dominic. You're going to be Bob from now on. Because we say so. But it says in Daniel 1.8 that Daniel resolved in his heart not to defile himself and to partake of the delicacies of the king's table. And it says that they asked their overseer to allow them to do vegetables and water for 10 days and to come back and test them. And Hasphanaz doesn't want to do it at first. He's like, you guys are going to lose, actually cause me to lose my life when you're shriveling up and you're no longer useful to the king. And Daniel says, come back and test us. And what a lot of times we overlook is that it says after the 10-day evaluation that Hasphanaz came back and evaluated them and saw them, I like it in the New King James or the King James, saw them to be more fleshly than the rest. And it says he allowed them to continue Well, their training period was three years, which we find out at the end of their three-year schooling, they entered into the king's service full-time. Why is it that we only and always ever hear about a Daniel fast being the chapter 10 version, which is 21 days, no meats, no sweets, no carbs, all of that stuff? What about the chapter 1 version, three years of vegetables and water? I was like, because, Mike, the chapter 10 version is easier. Duh, like... (laughs) three years vegetables and water would you say yes to that (laughs) he's like bro you can't start by talking about Big Macs and Ronald McDonald and then get into like three years vegetables and water like bro what kind of sick twist is this like (laughs) three years vegetables and water Verse 17, and unto Daniel and his three friends, wisdom, learning, insight, understanding. Verse 18, and unto Daniel, because there's always something special for those who initiate. And unto Daniel, the ability to interpret dreams and visions of all kinds. Not so that he could start some Facebook ministry interpreting dreams with a cash app in the comment section. You're only laughing because you scroll over it every day. Facebook profits and parking lot profits and all of this nonsense. People interpreting dreams for money and all this. This is not who Daniel was. It was a spiritual impartation for him to stay alive, to thrive for decades under wicked, tyrannical government structures. It saved his life in chapter 2. Three years, vegetables and water, so that you can get supernatural wisdom, insight, learning, understanding, so that you can have a spiritual impartation 
to interpret dreams and visions of all kind. Well, Mike, you just don't get it, bro. Um, if I want to kind of learn up on dream interpretation, there's all kinds of books I can read. There's all kinds of YouTube videos I can watch. Bro, like I can just jump on so-and-so's podcast. Daniel got offered, would you say yes to this? But let's not try to pretend like Daniel understood the consequences of the yes that he was giving over. You see, because I, I think a lot of times we rob the story of the humanity that's involved whenever we take the end and assume it in the beginning as we're tracking through the story. To act like Daniel knew that if he did three years of vegetables and water, that this is what God was going to do. I don't think he knew. You give me this yes, and I get to determine the consequences of what this yes is going to produce. Well, that doesn't seem to have any connection point. This is where it only makes sense in God. You give me the yes that I'm asking for, and then I'll determine the, rec the receiving end of you offering me that yes. I'll determine what you're the benefactor of. I'll determine the consequences, the reaping of you sowing a yes into me as I'm asking you. What could a yes do? For Daniel, it actually radically changed his whole life. What could a yes do? For Esther, she was in place. And in Esther chapter 4, the thought was, go in and see the king. Your people are being slaughtered out here in the streets. Mordecai comes with an intervention in chapter 4. And he's like, your people are being slaughtered in the streets. And I like to look at it as a sort of divine intervention. You see, because sometimes we're standing in the right place to say yes we just don't have the right perspective to see the yes that we're supposed to give and Mordecai has to come and almost in some ways to say like Esther snap out of it what does he tell her it's not because you're super cute it's not it's not because you're super cute it's not because you were better than everybody else it's not because God wanted to provide a way for you to hide here while all the rest of your people were being slaughtered in the streets. He says, Esther, wake up. God has you in the right place. You just don't have the right perspective. You're standing on the right platform, but you're trying to use it for your own purpose. You don't see yet the reason why God puts you where he puts you. God puts you where he puts you because there's a yes that he's asking you for. And unless you wake up, unless you snap out of it, unless you actually start to see things the way that God is seeing things, you are going to dismiss the yes that God is looking for in this moment of history. And what does he tell her? He says, if you won't do what God is asking you to do, he's going to raise up deliverance from another source. What does this mean? Man, this means that we are irreplaceable to God. There's nobody like you. Nobody can love him the way that you do. Nobody can say yes to him the way that you do. You are irreplaceable to God. When you lift your voice, when you sing, when you worship, when you whisper, he is attentive. He turns in your direction. He longs for your affection, your personally, individually, you. Not in a corporate crowd, but all alone. He wants you. You are irreplaceable to God. But we are all replaceable in the will of God. Because we don't get to determine if he's going to do what he wants to do. You see, that would make us Lord. We are not Lord. He is Lord. We don't get to determine whether he does it or not. We get to determine our level of participation in what it is that he is choosing to do. And this is what Mordecai tells Esther. If you won't do it, then God is going to raise up someone else that will say yes to him the way that he is longing to have someone say yes to him. You don't get to determine if he gets the yes. You just get to determine if he gets it from you. Abram, leave your family. I will be your God. I will covenant myself to you. When you study out the ancient world, you understand that Abram was a part of a multi-million dollar family. Everything was tribal. Your family line, which you were born into, was your inheritance. 
It was all communal. It was family oriented. To leave your family was to abandon everything that you had ever known about life and your way of identification. Abram, step away from it all. Come out and be separate. I will identify with you. You will identify with me from this day forward. I will be your God. I will be your inheritance. I will be your portion. Forsake all of the material things and promises that this life has to offer you. All of your tribal real estate and your inheritance of income. Walk away from it all. Would you be willing, Abram, to give me this yes? We have that contrasted with the rich young ruler in Mark 10, who, when presented the opportunity to give yes to Jesus his way, it said that he had a lot of real estate in this life and that his heart was more anchored in the things of this world than giving Jesus the yes that he desired. Abram, would you give me that yes? And Abram says, I will. And in chapter 15 of Genesis, we find Abram in a deep sleep. And we find the Lord making him a promise. God is faithful to his word. We find Abram in a deep sleep. And he says, years from now, hundreds of years from now, your descendants are going to be taken into captivity. They're going to be brought into exile. And they're going to be ruled over or governed over by a people that are not theirs. They're going to be wicked and they're going to treat them badly. And they're going to be there for hundreds of years. But he says, Abram, don't worry. I will come for them and I will deliver them from this bondage and I will raise them up and I will send them out into the land that I have promised them. And they will come forth from that land and that time of subjection and exile and enslavement. They will come forth out of those hundreds of years with many possessions and articles of clothing and silver and gold. Abram, this is the word that I'm giving you. It's the promise that I'm making with you. I'm covenanting myself to you by giving you my word. Psalm 138.2, he has exalted his word above his own name. If you've received a promise from the Lord tonight, I want you to know that God is faithful. God is faithful. He's more faithful than you want him to be. He's more faithful than you believe that he is. He's more faithful even in times when you think that he forgot. He's more faithful even in times where you feel like you've made so many decisions to mess it all up. He's more faithful, it says that in times where we are not faithful, that he can't be anything but faithful because even when we would choose to deny him, he can't deny being himself because he is what he is and he is faithful because I am what I am and I can't change and I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Abram receives a promise from God. If you've received a promise from the Lord, I want you to raise your hand so I know where you are. Abram receives a promise from God. And he says, hundreds of years from now, your descendants are going to be taken into slavery. We find the introduction of a man named Joseph. That's Genesis 15 with Abram, a man named Joseph in Genesis 37. And we find that God gives this young man a dream. And it brings all of the insecurities and the arrogance and the pride. Because you see, sometimes we get a word and we just don't know how to carry it right. (laughs) And and most of our problems isn't necessarily because of like other people that are around us. But it's because we're not carrying it well. And Joseph gets introduced into the narrative. He enters into the timeline. Because God is consistent with his story and he's faithful to bring his word to pass. And Joseph comes in in Genesis 37, and he rises with this dream. God spoke to me. I'm going to be the man. It's cool. You don't have to believe it now. You're all going to bow. All of you. Look down on me if you want to. Treat me poorly if that's what you want to do. I'm going to be the man. And it starts a process in his life. And we find that at the end, before Joseph is going to die, in Genesis 50, it says his brothers come back and they don't know who he is yet. He's got the mask or the veil on. And they come and they bow down before him. And they're broken. 
because they think that they're going to die because Joseph had planted something in their bags and they didn't realize it in the whole story and it was kind of a setup. And, but it says that Joseph takes his mask off and he weeps over them. And he says, you tried to kill me, but God is using it. What you tried to harm me with, you tried to kill me. He said, I spent a lot of years being angry at you, weeping through the night, thinking about what you did to me. But now I realize that it's all part of a process that God was using in order to fulfill the dream that he gave to me. Only the spirit can do this. And Joseph is weeping over the people that tried to kill him. Joseph is blessing those that accused him and pushed him into the pit and left him for dead. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. They criticized his dream. They cast him out. And Joseph is now standing in a place of fulfillment, but he has a different perspective because he understands that different investments into the timeline actually helped him get where he was supposed to be rather than hindering him from the things that God had said to him. And in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24 and 25, as the chapter is closing, Joseph says something that is unique. He says, there will come a time where you are going to enter into being enslaved. He says, but don't worry. God is going to be faithful. He's going to come for you. He says, and in those days when God comes for you, he says, make me a promise that you're going to take my bones with you whenever God comes to deliver you from the tyranny of slavery. We have to understand that from the moment that Abram received the promise in Genesis 15 to the moment that Joseph recognizes the inheritance of the promise that's been given down through the ages, that it's been 400 years. 400 years, and God has not forgotten his word. Sometimes we go two weeks and we're like, Lord, like, like, I mean, like, where are you? Like, I mean, do you remember what you said two days ago? Like, like, I mean, for real? 400 years and God hasn't forgotten his word. But obviously there's a faithfulness to steward the things that God has said down through decades and centuries. Through decades and centuries, there's a faithfulness to steward the things that we know God has said. His word that has entered into the timeline of our lives because he is faithful to bring to pass the word that he releases. For my word will accomplish the purpose for which I send it forth. And it will not return unto me void, is what Isaiah 55 says. And Joseph says, the day that God comes to get you, promise me that you're going to take my bones with you. And then we find another man who enters into the timeline by the name of Moses. And Moses, too, has tried to carry out the things that God has said to him his own way. Right, man? Like, sometimes we know what God wants to do. We just don't know the way that he's going to do it. And we work so hard trying to help him out. Right? Like, Moses knows that he's got this call this like royal call on his life. Like I'm called to be a deliverer. Like I feel it in my bones, man. Like I know that God is going to use me. I know that this is what he said. He's marked my life. This is actually something that God has said. I'm not just making it up. I'm not just adding deliverer to my business card. Like this is something that God is going to do, man. I know it. And it says that he goes out and he sees the Hebrew and the Egyptian fighting. And it says that he slaughters the Egyptian, buries him in the sand, and tries to cover it up as if nothing had happened. Yo, this is serious. <laughs> like, this is wild. Because he knows what God wants to do. He has an idea of the way that God wants to use him. He's just trying to make it happen his own way. And he has to go into 40 years of brokenness. 40 years out in the middle of nowhere. 40 years of obscurity. But it says that God comes looking for him because he's faithful to the things that he said to him. And it says that he encounters him in a burning bush. And what does he tell him in Exodus chapter 3? He says, it's actually not even about you. That's helpful for some of us. Right? Like, like some of us need to hear, myself included. Oh, it ain't about you, bro. Like this ain't got nothing to do with you. 
It ain't because you're super popular, you're crazy funny. It ain't because you're really gifted. It ain't because you got a whole bunch of money. It ain't because you got the right relationships, right? Like Esther, it ain't because you're super cute and just better than everybody else. Like, hey, don't get it twisted. This is not about you. God is trying to do something. And in Exodus chapter 3, he tells Moses, I am coming to get you, and I am going to raise you up. You're going to have more than a million person following, right? Some of us can't handle 15 followers. Like, we get 100 likes, and all of a sudden, we walk different, right? Like, like you can't talk to me that way. You know how many subscribers I got? Do you see how many shares I got on that last video I just put up? You, you can't talk to me like that anymore. He says, the covenant cries of my people have come up before me. He said, and I remember what I promised them. He said, and I'm longing to be faithful to my covenant. I'm longing to be faithful to my word. And so I'm looking for someone in a particular moment of history to partner with me according to things that I have said, according to desires that I am working out, according to the agenda that I have launched inside of time. I am going to be faithful to what it is that I am doing, and I'm looking for people to give me a yes so that I can involve them in what it is that I am doing This is what I'm looking for from you, Moses. Are you willing? He says, I'm longing to be faithful to my covenant and the covenant people. I've made them a promise and I'm going to make good on it. Because he never makes a promise that he doesn't have the power to perform. Never. There is no promise that God makes that he does not have the power to actually perform it. He can make good on every single thing regardless of how wild. It doesn't matter how much mission impossible you might think it is. It doesn't matter how different or abstract the circumstances may seem in order for God to do the things that he's revealed to you. He has power to perform every promise. And he says, Moses, this is who I am. And we find Moses going through a wild series of events that leads up to the final plague, and it's the plague of the firstborn. And as we track through Exodus 11 and 12 and 13, we find very interesting language. In Exodus 11, 2 and 3, after God speaks to Moses, it says that he's out giving instruction to the children of Israel. And it says that he's reminding them of the word of the Lord and what it is that God has said to him. Because God has said to him that he is going to rout the Egyptians. He has said to him that they are going to rise out of slavery, that God is going to be faithful to take them into the land that he promised them, and that when they come out, that he is going to rout their enemies. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. It says that he is going to arise in great signs and wonders, conquer all of the gods and idols of Egypt, and reveal himself as Yahweh, the Most High. And when he does that, they are going to come into the land that he promised them coming out with many possessions, articles of clothing, and silver and gold. This is insane. This is the same thing that God promised would happen when he spoke to Abram. And Moses is relaying the word of the Lord, something that God has told him. Then we find it in Exodus 12, 35 and 36. Moses is once again laying down the charge of what it is that God has said. And we know that the plague of the firstborn happens. And it's the night of Passover. And the blood is on the doorpost and death literally passes over instead of passing through. And that all of the Israelites and their children and God's promise to preserve them, that God is faithful. But it says that when they rise and they're coming out, in Exodus 13, verse 19, we find peculiar words. Now, now they are exiting Egypt. They are coming out of hundreds of years of slavery. They are rising through signs and wonders and the experience of an epic deliverance. And Moses stops them before they actually go all the way out. And in Exodus 13, 19, this is what Moses says. 
we have to grab Joseph's bones. What? Like, bro, it's been hundreds of years, and you're worried about a sack of bones somewhere? This is what I want you to understand. The scripture tells us that it was 430 years to the day on the night of Passover that they came out. What does this mean? 430 years was from the moment where Joseph, who entered into Egypt 30 years prior than his family, his family came down and then they were enslaved for a period of 400 years after Pharaoh who died, who was favorable to Joseph. Prior to that 400 year period was when God spoke to Abram. You have 400 years where God speaks to Abram in a dream. 400 years later where Joseph is identifying by the word of the Lord what it is that is in God's heart to do. And he says, make me a promise 400 years later. Does anybody know what God said 10 days ago? 400 years later, there is a tracking with a desire that God has. And Joseph recognizes that God longs to do something. And he's not going to forget about it. 400 years after he tells his brothers and his family, when God actually does it, don't forget my bones. 400 years later is when the night of Passover is happening. And Moses and the children of Israel are coming out. Out. They are experiencing a deliverance. It has been 800 years since God has made a promise, but God has not forgotten about the things that he has said. You see, because I, I think sometimes it's a whole lot easier for us to think that we're birthing something. Right? Like, like I'm starting something. Why? Because I'm the man. And God's given me a vision, and I'm birthing a movement. I'm birthing a ministry. I'm starting this. I'm creating this. And, it, and, and really, it's, it's the pride of man that would rather see themselves as the initiator rather than the fulfillment. <laughs> but really, it's the pride of man. It's our own ego that would rather consider the effort or the investment of our life. Well, it's not going to be worth enough if I'm just fulfilling something. Because then I don't get to take credit for the idea. And bro, I can't be the face of the franchise. And it's not going to be as important for me. And nobody's going to really think that I'm all that. If like I'm just saying that I'm in the continuation of something that God has been doing. Rather than initiating something that God is doing. Because it all started with me. Let me just encourage you with something. Very rarely are we actually starting anything. More times than not, if we would actually be willing to realize what's happening in a moment, is we are the fulfillment of the faithful tears of others. We are the answer to those that have sown and sown, fasting and praying, decades, centuries of believing God, longing for breakthrough, contending for the word of the Lord to prevail, giving the investment of their life, and at times not actually seeing the reaping of the consequences, though they were asked to give a hefty investment Maybe they weren't the ones that fully got to see what it was that God was longing to do. As it speaks of that faithful company in Hebrews 11, many of them not actually laying hold of the promises that God made to them, gave God the yes and emptied their whole life in obedience, knowing that he was going to join us together. So that without them, we would be incomplete. And so that without us, they would be incomplete. But that there's a generational impact. That there, God is a God of generations. He tells Moses in Exodus 3, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this will be the way that I memorialize my name to you forever throughout the rest of the timeline as you know it. So that whenever you think of me, you won't only think of your moment of history, but that you will have to honor those that have gone before you. You will have to recognize that there's been an investment before you were ever born. 
turn. You will have to acknowledge that I've walked with others who have fasted and prayed and wept and cried out through the night and given the entirety of their lives in order to set you up in the moment of history that you now are afforded the opportunity to give God the yes that he's asking for. Moses, it's not about you. It's not about you. But there's something that I'm longing to do. And it's the pride of man that would rather see themselves as the starter, as the initiator, as the one that's actually done something that can have the credit taken for. You see, the Lord spoke to us years ago that there would come a day where we would host holy assemblies all throughout the United States. And I'm going to close in just a moment. For some of you who were worried that I was really going to go till 1.30. You're like, man, the way that he's rolling right now, like he, I don't think he was playing. Like, <laughs> like bro, we've been through half the Bible already. Like, <laughs> the Lord spoke to us years ago, right after I got born again, which is going to be 20 years, that there would come a season of our life where he would invite us to have in a front and center kind of way, a focus on the United States. Yes, the nations, our hearts burn to go and will continue to go. The gospel must be preached to all peoples. But that there would come a season where the Lord would invite us with a special interest or a special yes that would be given to the United States and that we would begin hosting holy assemblies, solemn gatherings with the heart of Joel chapter 2, that it'd be time to sound the trumpet, to weep and to wail, to put down our egos and our logos, and to rally laborers in the harvest field unto God's purposes in our hour of history, in the generation that we have right now. God has chosen us for such a time as this. We are alive for right now. None of us have the privilege to choose a different piece of the timeline in order to be faithful to God. We have the moment that we have, and that moment is called right now. And you were born. You were strategically assigned. God formed you and said yes to you and planted you right here so that you could say yes to him in this moment of history. And the Lord spoke to us that there would come a day But what's interesting is, up until recent days, I didn't know that there was anyone who had ever been born again in my whole family. Ever. Some of you know my story. Drug addict, drug dealing, in and out of jail, disease, suicidal, violent, broken, dangerous, just just super dark, really messed up. Feeling incredibly distant from God. Not having a value for life or ruining the lives of others. Up until recent days, I didn't know that I was not the only one that had ever been born again in my family. I thought that God intervened in my family line and rescued me from darkness, which he did. But I didn't know that there had any been any others. Because in talking with other family members, no one had ever recounted ancestors. I don't know any cousins, aunts, uncles, period, on either side that have been born again. To be raised my whole life without a knowledge of God and then to be rescued by a God that I didn't even believe existed. To be grafted in to a divine story, his story. For him to save me from my own life and put me into his story. And now through my yes to him to continue making history or the advancing of his story. But to imagine never knowing anyone else that had ever been born again, to not have any idea of any other Christians in my family ever, then the Lord led me on this recent, wild, random journey. He asked me to do the Ancestry.com. And I was like, Lord, I mean, the government's already got my info. I've been to jail so many times, like... (laughs) Like, bro, spit in a little jar. Who cares? You know what I mean? Like, man, like, they've already got all my stuff. Like, okay, fine. I was like, what does it matter? Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, why would you ask me to do this? Like, like, this is nonsense. This is super silly. 
Like, like what's the purpose of this? Right? I'm not trying to pretend that I'm above anybody else that's in the room. At times, I too wrestle with the different yeses that he's asking for. But the Lord was on me, do it. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I get to know what I am then. And I did it. And my results came back and I was like, okay, that's cool. Right? Like I've got a bunch of Irish and a bunch of Scottish and man, I've got some African and I've got this and I've got that. And like, oh, awesome, man. And for almost two years, it was like, so what? Like, what did that even mean? Like, where is that going? And one day I got an email. And following the rabbit trail that this Ancestry.com email provided me, because when you sign up for the deal, it, it emails you hints and, hey, this might be, you know, your hand and this might be, and what about this guy and what about that guy? And in a matter of 10 minutes, I was able to recover almost 700 years of ancestry and found out that in the 1700s that my ancestors had come over and were a part of the first great awakening. And my ancestors, listen to this, David and Ruth Dow, in the first great awakening, sitting there listening to the circuit riders, sitting in the preaching of those that literally shook the nation. From those days of the great awakening, the first great awakening got pregnant with a little boy and gave birth to a little boy in January of 1777. And this little boy was named Enoch Dow. And Enoch Dow was the last known preacher of the gospel in my family, born out of the first great awakening, rising Reverend Enoch Dow. There's eight generations between me and Enoch. There's not another person that I know between that of someone who was born again, that was a minister of any sort, that had a passion for God's purposes in our nation. What am I saying? It'd be easy for me to see my own desires in light of something that God just began with me. But hundreds of years ago, there were faithful people that were crying out that God would answer his faithfulness, that God would break in and prove himself to be faithful, that God would do in accordance to what he said he would do. And I'm just challenging everyone in the room to possibly consider your life in light of the answer to prayers that have been prayed, that your life is the answer to generations behind you. Your life is God's faithfulness to the way that he set things up for you to say yes to him. Your life and the way that he has built your life is the way that he is going to display his honoring of his own name, the honoring of his own word, the faithfulness of who he is throughout generations, that you are an answer. And it's why you can't overlook any yes. Every yes. We spend more time trying to give big yeses when God is interested in every yes. I've never seen a person that he's used greatly that's never said yes in a great way privately. Never. Because the test often comes in private. Because if God can trust you in private, he can trust you in public. But many of us want to be faithful in public And we want to overlook all of the private faithfulness. We want to dismiss and discredit. We want to disqualify having to say yes when no one else is around. But let me tell you the way that it often looks. Before you get trusted with being the father of nations, you have to be faithful being the father of one son. Abram, I'm going to make you the father of nations. Well, I don't even have a son. Well, I'm going to give you a son and then I'm going to test you with him. I'm going to test you with one son so that I can make you the father of nations. 
Well, Elijah, before I can trust you to stretch your life over an entire nation, I have to trust you to stretch your life over a dead boy in private. Because if you're not willing to extend yourself over the dead boy in private, then you're not really doing it for me. You're doing it for them. (laughs) You're doing it for the applause. You're doing it for the crowds. But if I can trust you in private when no one else is around, if I can trust you in moments of brokenness and obscurity, if I can trust you in hiddenness, if I can trust you when it's just you and me, right? That's what he tells Abram. Now I know that I can bless you the way I've always wanted to bless you. Now I know that I can fulfill every word that I've ever spoken to you. Now I know that nothing is ever going to come between me and you and your heart. Now I know that because you weren't willing to preserve the life of your son, your promised son, the one that you know is connected to everything I've ever spoken to you, now I know that I can fulfill everything that I've always wanted to do with you. Abram, now I can trust you. Elijah, now I can trust you. Why? Because you were willing to give me the yes when no one else was around. What yes is God asking you for when no one else is around? What yes is he asking you for that you overlook? He asked John the Baptist for a yes that was attached to his diet and his wardrobe. God doesn't care about those things. Who says? He asked Daniel for things that pertain to his diet and public ridicule. God's not interested in those things. Who says? He told the rich young ruler to go and give away all of his prized possessions and then to come back and follow him his way. Well, God would never ask me to do that. He's trying to utilize all of my resources for kingdom purposes. Who says? You or him? God needs my platform. Who says? You or him? He asked Esther to risk her life, not using her platform for her own purpose or preservation, but to have a wildly different perspective of why it might be that God put her in the place where she was. Are you willing to believe that I've spent decades of getting you where I got you so that you could use it to fulfill what I want to do with it and not just the way that you think is best to continue to advance it? Abram, would you be willing to let go of all of your family inheritance. Abandon your people. Walk with me, Abram. I will be everything to you. Well, nobody's ever done that before. Nobody in my family's ever moved away. Nobody's ever gone that way. Nobody's ever stepped aside. Man, if I quit the family business, you don't understand what I'm going to have to go through. If I put it all down, the price that I'm going to have to pay. Why do we spend more time worrying about the price that we're going to have to pay than the one to whom we are giving it? Why do you spend more time thinking about what you're going to lose out on rather than considering the one that is going to give himself to you? Why is it always our focus? I don't know what I would do without this. I'll give myself to you, I promise. Mike, you don't understand. I don't know who I would be if I wasn't this. I will identify with you. Take my name upon you. Walk with me, be an exile, be a sojourner, be a faithful friend of mine and pass through this life. I promise you it's fading, but I will reward you. All of you who leverage all of your life against my reward at the end of the age, I promise I will be good to you. I promise I won't let you down. Oh, I promise you it's going to be way more glorious than you can even imagine right now. All of you that are so worried about trying to preserve your life and trying to protect it and trying to build it your own way, oh, I promise you, to those who lose their life for my sake and the gospel, you're really going to find your life. And you'll come alive when you give me the yes that I'm asking you for. Would you say yes to me and become my intimate friend? Would you say yes to me and love me through your yielded 
obedience. Would you say yes to me and be known as one who's been joyfully conquered? (laughs) I delight to do my Father's will. This is the heart cry of sons and daughters that have been beautifully broken. We've been broken, and so we easily bend under the weight of his will. We found delight. Oh, I have food that you know not of. My nourishment comes from giving him the yes that he desires. Father, I know that there's a million other ways that this cup could go, but don't let this cup pass me by. I have power to produce a bunch of different outcomes, but not my will, Lord. Your will be done. Crush me if you crush me. Have your oil that you desire from me. Here I am a fragrant offering in my generation. You can have me, Jesus. Whatever it means and wherever it goes, I will be yours. Because there is no greater joy to this life than continually giving myself over to the one that has given himself up for me. It's been said of John the Baptist that he was able to offer up his head because he had spent a lifetime offering up his stomach. (laughs) For John the Baptist came in fasting and prayer. (laughs) Don't overlook the yes that he's asking you for. And quit trying to figure out where it's going. Quit trying to put it all together to analyze him, to figure him out. If you would give me the yes, I'll determine the impact. And would you be okay if your yes created an impact in another generation? (laughs) We have such a limited scope and perspective. You can have me, Jesus. Come on, I'm going to take a moment right here before I ask you to respond in a particular way. Holy Spirit all over the room. John 6, 44 says, No man can come unless the Spirit first draws him. Again, I like it in the passion. It says, no man's able to come unless my father by the spirit initiates a tug on your heart and then gives you the ability to open up and embrace me. (laughs) Behold, I stand at the door and I knock looking for someone to open up and to say yes because I'm longing to have intimate friends oh to be a friend of the Lord (laughs) I want you to trust me Jesus I want you to trust me Jesus you can have my yes Ask for it wherever, wherever you wish, wherever you wish.
there are very few that actually respond with an excellent yes. It's open for everyone. I'm calling everybody, but somebody has to respond. I believe the Lord is looking for intimate friends tonight. A people who would love him with their yes. Tonight where you're sitting, if you would say, you can have that from me, Lord. You can have it from me. All the wrestling is going to come to an end if you would give me grace. All the fighting to try to establish my own way, it's going to come to an end if, if, you, would, if you would touch my heart tonight and give me grace. I'll say yes to you. I'm just going to ask you, if you feel a tug on your heart tonight by the Spirit, would you just respond to Him? I'm going to invite you to come to the front. You can come and sit, you can come and kneel, you can come and lay on your face. You can have me. You can have my yes. Come on, just begin to come. 